All right, Western Civ, we're going to get back to uh, World War I. We left off discussing uh, some of the different fronts, Turkish front, the Italian front. So 1915, um, this is when the war uh, starts to settle into a routine. Uh, the trenches have been built, and uh, both sides, the, uh, the Allied side, which is the French and the British, are in uh, their own trenches, uh, opposed to the Germans, who are uh, fighting in their own trenches, which were pretty, pretty updated, actually. So um, the war has stalled after the first Battle of the Marne. And so for the Germans, they're going to launch a series of offensive in the Ypres. Uh, and that's an area of southern uh, Belgium, right along the French border. It's a salient. Uh, there's a few rivers that flow through that. So they're going to uh, launch multiple offensives. At the second Battle of the Ypres, uh, in 1915, the Germans will unleash the first poison gas, uh, trying to break the stalemate. Uh, they'll use chlorine. Uh, it uh, had kind of a yellowish tint. The French actually fled the battlefield, but the Germans did not have their masks on properly, so they got poisoned as well, and so it was ineffective. And they also didn't have a lot of reserves either. So, 1916, the Allies are going to launch their offensives around the Somme River, which is in northern France. Um, horrific, horrific numbers of casualties. Uh, in one battle of the Somme, uh, 600,000 men were lost and they only gained a few miles. So uh, very devastating. That same year, late 1916, the Germans, they will attack um, the strategic and very sacred French town of Verdun, okay? And I put a little battle map here. Um, Verdun is a historical city. Uh, dating back to the days of Charlemagne, uh, the French uh, considered it very sacred. Uh, they knew, the Germans knew, that the French would do whatever they could to hold it. So we know today the Battle of Verdun was really um, a battle of attrition. They just wanted to kill as many French soldiers as they could, hoping that they could eventually break the will to fight. And so um, it was a nine-month uh, campaign to fight around Verdun. Uh, <laughs> the Germans were defeated, but as it says here, it was a... Pyrrhic victory, if you know the old story of Pyrrhic victory, um, they lost thousands, hundreds of thousands of men defending that one town. Uh, by 1917, the beginning of 1917, um, things have really gotten bad. Um, the French have a new commander, General Nivelle, and uh, he launches a offensive, or at least plans to, uh, in the Somme River region, and it's a disaster because when he sends the men out, uh, they refused to go. The French refused to leave the trenches, and so these mass mutinies hit one after another. Um, the thing is, though, is they kept it quiet. Um, the French people did not find out about it until 50 years later uh, that this had happened, but they uh, pulled out groups of men and executed them uh, when they you know, failed to leave the trenches, and it was so bad that the British will launch a secondary offensive um, at Passchendaele which is near the Belgian border. And we know today the British, the British launched that Battle of Passchendaele trying to basically give the French a break and hopefully raise their morale. It didn't work. All right, the war at sea. Um, the battles at sea will be a little different. Um, the British had, of course, still the best surface fleet. They will um, basically launch their entire force into uh, the Kiel Canal region, which is in the northern part of Germany, and they will completely bottle up the German fleet. The German fleet can't leave their harbor. Um, the only sea battle uh, that really happens was at Jutland, off the coast of Denmark. Um, the British had uh, loosened their blockade, and so the, the Germans were able to get some uh, ships out to sea. But as you can see, it was a devastating one-sided defeat for the British Navy. Um, and from that point on, the uh, German Navy, the, at least the surface fleet, really had no no possibility to do anything. So to maintain their supply lines and to break uh, that blockade, the Germans had resorted to U-boats. They had started building the first submarines uh, before the war. And if you know what U-boat means, it means undersea booten or undersea boat. Uh, <clears throat> they could be very uh, difficult. Was well, I heard a number one in three uh, German sailors never made it back from, un from uh, sailing in U-boats because sometimes they just sank. They literally would go down under the water and, and they would you know sink to the bottom because of uh, technical issues. So it was very difficult uh, fighting. But the U-boats, uh, their job really was to uh, try to break the blockade by uh, targeting British shipping. 
Uh, they targeted military ships, they targeted merchant ships. And remember, merchant ships are coming from all over the world, especially from the United States. And so our ships were often targeted. 1915, there was a famous incident with the Lusitania. Right here, Lusitania was a, um, it's basically a cruise liner, you know, like taking Carnival, uh, but it was torpedoed off the coast of Ireland, killing uh, nearly 1,200 people. 128 of them were Americans. Um, the ship sank in like less than 10 minutes, if I remember. It was hit by multiple torpedoes. Now, President Wilson protested because it was a cruise ship, uh, and they basically said the Germans could not target cruise ships. By the way, the German rationale was that they knew the Lusitania was transporting weapons. Now, we denied this. We admitted it later on that, yes, they were transporting weapons. And the reason that the Germans knew and couldn't say was they had spies. They had spies in America uh, traveling around the various ports uh, spying on the ships. So they saw weapons being put aboard the Lusitania. I read a book about it a couple of years ago. It's a really good book. So, um, And really, the Lusitania was a true disaster. The captain had been warned multiple times, and uh, he didn't sail in a very smart manner. So looking back, the Lusitania was a tragedy that could have been avoided. Um, so the, the Germans did back off the uh, what they called unrestricted submarine warfare. But then in 1916, uh, they attacked a ship called the Sussex. Uh, it was traveling between France and Britain. Um, it didn't sink, but it was damaged when it was hit by a couple of torpedoes. Um, several Americans were injured. Over 50 people were killed from other nations. And this time, Wilson told the Germans that um, war could happen. And so the Germans took what was called the Sussex Pledge that they would suspend unrestricted submarine warfare again. So Sussex Pledge was, was really a, an attempt to keep America out of the war. All right, so... When uh, Wilson is reelected in November of 1916, he feels it is his job to try to get a peace treaty, okay? So he tries to mediate a peace. The problem is, is that, again, by this time, um, you know, thousands, if not millions of men uh, were dead and wounded. And so neither side really wanted to give in. Well, there's a couple of events that will bring America closer to war. The first was the release of the Zimmerman telegram right here. Okay, um, this was sent by the German minister, Arthur Zimmerman, to uh, his counterpart in Mexico City. Um, the Zimmerman telegram basically told the Mexicans that um, we were going, we the Germans, were going to resume unrestricted submarine warfare, and we think that this could get the Americans involved. If the Americans get involved, would you like to ally with us? Uh, against the United States. And at that time, um, and we'll talk about this more in recent American history, uh, the relations between U.S. and Mexico were horrible. Um, we were very nearly, had, we'd ar already nearly gone to war a couple of times under Wilson's administration. So offering Mexico an alliance by the Germans made sense because the Mexicans and the Americans were not getting along. Um, the te telegram was intercepted by the British, who then handed it over to the Americans, who were not very happy that um, that the Germans were, you know, basically saying that war was going to happen and let's make an alliance with our southern neighbor. And then uh, the German Navy had also announced that they were going to resume unrestricted submarine warfare again. So after a year, they were going to start targeting any ship that came in and around the British Isles. In March 1917, we have the Russian Revolution. Now, you don't think about the Russian Revolution playing a role, but it does, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. So by early April, America had broken off relations with Germany. Uh, President Wilson went to Congress and asked for a declaration of war. In the request, he says, we will make the world safe for democracy, and pretty soon, American forces will be shipped off to Europe to fight against the central powers, which is Austria, Hungary, Ottoman Empire, and of course, Germany. All right, so what's going on in Russia? Because this plays a big role and people often forget about this. So in 1916, the Tsarist government is really starting to fall apart. Um, Nicholas II had left in 1915 um, to head off to the battlefield on the Eastern Front trying to you know, lead the Russian army to victory. Uh, it was basically a disaster. Um, Nicholas did not have really any military skill. And so him being on the front did nothing to change the fortunes of the Russians and they were losing battle after battle. Uh, they'd lost millions of soldiers, either to combat or to capture or starvation. 
Um, Nicholas had gone so far as suspending the Duma. He had suspended the Russian parliament and was ruling by decree, even though he was, you know, off at the battlefield. Uh, his wife was focused on the teachings of Rasputin, okay? So for those of you who've seen the Disney movie Anastasia, yes, Rasputin was real. He was not a, um, <laughs> he was not a ghost or anything like that, like they see in the movie. But he did have um, exorbitant power. He had a lot more power um, under the royal family than he should have. And um, people didn't trust him. And so uh, he ends up being assassinated in 1916, right before uh, the you know, beginning of the Russian Revolution. Well, by early February 1917, there were strikes or demonstrations. Um, the workers were angry. Uh, they were frustrated with the behavior of the royal family. And so um, the strikes broke out. Nicholas ordered his troops to open fire on the protesters. They refused. And so it was called the February Revolution because it took place in February 1917. By March, they had reconstituted the Duma. Nicholas agreed to abdicate in favor of his brother, Grand Duke Michael. Now, give it to Michael. Michael was, was a smart guy. He could read the writing on the wall, and he says, um, I will only take the job if I am approved by the, the Duma, the assembly. Okay? Um, the Duma was done with the royal family. They didn't want them anymore, so they said no. So Michael never took the job. So for the next eight months, between February and November, um, we have a provisional government headed by Alexander Kerensky, okay? Kerensky was part of that group that called themselves the Mensheviks, okay? The other individual who plays a role is Lenin. Lenin has come back to Russia from, a, uh, from exile in, in Switzerland, okay? Now, you're probably wondering, how does Lenin get back to Russia in the middle of a war? Well, he was put on a train in Switzerland many believe by the Germans. <laughs> and the Germans basically told Lenin, you know, we will get this train through the battle lines. You, you know, you have a job. When you get back to Russia, your job is to get, the, get them out of the war. It's a bit of a conspiracy theory. There is some basis in fact, but you know, hardcore Russian believers believe that Lenin would never work with the Germans. But there are some historians who believe that Lenin would do anything he could to get power. And if that meant, you know, a sworn enemy getting him back to his country, he would do it. So like I said, one of those uh, conspiracy theories that, that has a little bit of possible merit. So he's going to put, uh, by the way, the train that he traveled on was sealed. No one else was allowed to get on it. And it basically ran from Switzerland through Germany uh, all the way uh, through the Scandinavian countries back to Russia. So... Um, when Lenin gets back, he will attempt a rebellion in the summer of 1917. It doesn't work. But then in November, he will lead another armed uprising. This time, they will take over the Russian government and depose Kerensky. Um, the whole story was chronicled by an American writer, John Reed, and it was called Ten Days That Shook the World. Okay. And by the way, there is uh, the Russian battlefront in 1916. And there is the beginning of the Febru February Revolution, newspaper about the November Revolution, and then, of course, 10 Days That Shook the World. All right, so the Russians did execute one last military offensive. Um, it was actually called the Kerensky Offensive because Alexander Kerensky ordered it. Um, complete disaster. Russians, you know, the army was basically falling apart. Uh, they retreated back to the nation's borders. And then when the Bolsheviks took power, one of the first things they did was they signed a treaty, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. And this treaty will surrender Poland, the three Baltic states, the Ukraine to Germany, and then territory in the south called the Transcaucasus to Turkey, okay? They also agreed to pay a fine, an indemnity, to the central powers. Now, again, going back to our story earlier, according to Russian supporters of Lenin, um, Lenin had to. He was, you know, backed into a corner. He didn't like the deal, but he had to because the Russian army couldn't continue. For those who believe in the conspiracy theory, Lenin was doing what he was told, which is, we got you back to Russia. Get your country out of the war. <laughs> okay? So, again, it's, uh, it's, it's what you believe. Okay? And, and that's what makes history so interesting. Now, once uh, Russia is out of the war, the Bolsheviks had renamed their forces the Red Army, they will start fighting the Mensheviks, who were referred to as the Whites, the White Army. So it is called the Russian Civil War, 
It's very brutal, goes on for about the next two years. And believe it or not, um, other countries did get involved. Um, the US uh, and a group of European nations will launch what's called the polar bear expedition. They will land in Murmansk, which is up here in Northern Russia, and they will actually participate in the Russian Civil War on behalf of the whites. Um, the war will last until 1922, the Bolsheviks will win. Once Lenin has power, he and his Lieutenant Leon Trotsky, they will impose what we now know as communism. Uh, they will seize land from large landowners. They will acquire factories, liquidate the banks, liquidate the national debt. He will seize the properties of the Russian Orthodox Church and again throws the entire government into chaos. Also in the midst of this, the royal family, the czarist family, which had been um, arrested, they will be sent to Yekaterinburg and then executed by the Bolsheviks. And believe today the reason they executed them was to basically eliminate any possible threat they could return. All right, so by the last year of the war, um, things have really changed. The American forces are going to start arriving in the summer of 1917. Um, the Allied forces were still dealing with that French mutiny. Uh, the Battle of Passchendaele had gone very horribly. Uh, the new commander for the American Expeditionary Force was John J. Pershing. Right there. Now, Pershing had just finished fighting uh, Mexican forces. He had gone looking for uh, Pancho Villa in 1916, uh, which had not gone well. So Pershing was eager to prove himself. When he gets over to Europe, the first thing he tells uh, the French and Allied commanders, uh, well, the French commander, the overall Allied commander, Ferdinand Foch, uh, and also the British commander, that the Americans were not going to fight in the trenches. Okay, um, Pershing felt that the trenches had done nothing. They, you know, brought no benefit uh, to the war. And so he said, you know, we're, we're here to fight, but we're not fighting in trenches. Foch tells Pershing, uh, you're not in charge. I'm the overall commander, and that's what I want you to do. You're going to replace, basically, the French troops that had mutinied. Well, when Pershing refused, this will delay the Americans getting involved. So Pershing tells the Allies, hey, we're going to go back here behind the lines and we're going to train. You tell us when you want to actually have us go and fight. Okay. Now, the Germans knew that with the Americans involved, that was going to be a game changer. So in the spring of 1918, the Germans will launch one huge last major offensive, the German Spring Offensive, um, hoping to end the war. Now, remember, they didn't have to deal with an Eastern Front. Russia was gone. So the Germans this time will push to the Marne. They will bombard Paris. Uh, they've got these huge uh, howitzers that were on railroad cars that they could fire 90 miles away. Um, but the Allies will counterattack, and again, Pershing will get his way. Um, the, the French will basically tell the Americans, okay, you're going to go fight in the Argonne Forest, which at this point was the toughest and worst front with no trenches. And so the Marines will fight at Cantigny, Belleau Wood, Soissons, Chateau Today, and they will lose a lot of guys. In fact, if you look at the Americans, how many soldiers they lost, uh, we only fought in the war for 19 months. And even though we didn't lose the thousands and even millions that the other sides did, um, we did lose a lot, a lot of guys, okay? So in 1918, uh, the Allies will launch their final offensive. It's called the Meuse Argonne Offensive or the Hundred Days Offensive. And this will push the Germans all the way back to the German border where they had built a series of fortifications called the Hindenburg Line, okay? Now, the fighting probably would have continued into Germany. But again, the Germans uh, don't want to be invaded. And so on November 9th, the Kaiser will flee to Holland and the remaining German forces will ask for an armistice. And so part of the reason that we have Veterans Day, it had been called Armistice Day, was they agreed that all guns will stop at 11 a.m. on November 11th. So 11, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month is when the fighting will stop. Okay. All right, when we pick up with the uh, next set of notes, we'll talk about what happens post-war, Versailles, and then um, some of the countries and how they deal with the aftermath of World War I.